button if you need technical support. During our panel discussion later, please use the Q&A button to share your questions and to vote for your favourite questions. Our colleagues will help group the questions to our panel for their views. Now, without further ado, let us start our webinar. Opening our session today is MPA Chairman Mr. Yam Chang Ming. Chairman, please. series which MPA seeks to engage and bring you views from experts and industry leaders to share their insights in a disrupted world. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm delighted to have with us international friends including IMO Secretary General Mr. Lim Kitai and distinguished industry players from the port, shipping and technology sectors. COVID-19 has compelled us to relook at how the maritime sector will change and take steps to be prepared for what lies ahead. As we focus our efforts for recovery amidst the headwinds caused by the pandemic, we must not lose sight of our broader goals, which is to accelerate our digitalization efforts and push harder on our decarbonization drive to better equip us for the new normal. This webinar today is part of the Maritime Perspective series which MPA seeks to engage and bring you views from experts and industry leaders to share their insights in a disrupted world. In the area of digitalization, even before COVID-19, there was already growing international consensus on the importance of common data standards to ensure that systems are inoperable. First, the IMO Facilitation Convention has made the electronic exchange of information for, for port clearance processes mandatory from April 2019. This has enabled port authorities to develop their maritime single windows. Second, concurrently, we are seeing more progress and traction for maritime digital platforms. For example, Calista, developed by PSA International and Global E-Trade Services, or GTS, onboarded Pacific International Lines to expand their shipper and freight forwarder footprint. Trade Lens, developed by IBM and MERS, has further integrated their cargo tracking function with industry players and government agencies. For today, I'm happy to announce that we will witness the inking of a multilateral memorandum of understanding with our partners to work on interoperability to enable further digitalization. The MOU today focuses on common data standards set out by IMO and enabling data exchange through the development of application programming interfaces or API specifications. The signatories are solution provider for the global shipping business network, CargoSmart, trade lens represented by GTD Solutions, Calista represented by PSA as port operator and GTS as solution provider, Port of Rotterdam Authority and Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. The MOU marks a strong commitment by these partners to collaborate on making concrete steps towards interoperability. After today, we will commence a series of technical workshops to design, test and implement the API specifications. This vision of seamlessly interoperability is what pushes Singapore to galvanize like-minded partners, including international port authorities, platform providers and ports to work together. We call this vision Digital Oceans, which stands for Digital Open, Common Exchange and Network Standardization. Using a common set of APIs, we will aspire to connect individual databases of platforms and port authorities, something which we call data lakes, into an interlinked digital ocean. This allows different systems to be interoperable without the need to adopt a common software or data platform. Our friends in different ports 
shipping networks, business platforms are already pursuing digitalization at different speeds. We need to move beyond the digitalization of single nodes in the maritime supply chain as the nature of our trade is one that is truly transactional, transnational. The MOU today is our first step. Tomorrow, we aspire for more partners to join us in realizing the digital bridge between ships, port authorities and platform providers and to facilitate seamless port-to-port -port connectivity, enabling effective information exchange and efficient transactions across the globe. Thank you for joining us here today and I wish you a fruitful session ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. May I now invite IMO Secretary General, Mr. Kitat Lim, to deliver the keynote address. Thank Jen, please. Uh, organizers, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to open this event on digital connectivity as driving the digitalization of shipping is more important than ever. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us with unprecedented impacts on our lives, our economies, and our societies, in particular on shipping business and the seafarers. It is crucially important to ensure the functioning of the global supply chains and the facilitation of safe and efficient operations of maritime transport. In these difficult times, the ability of shipping services and the seafarers to deliver vital goods, including medical supplies and food, is central to responding to and eventually overcoming this pandemic. I have spoken many times of our voyage together. Never has the speed of those words been more important than it is now. So I have been extremely impressed with the unprecedented level of cooperation and collaboration of all maritime stakeholders. We need to capitalize on this unprecedented cooperation as we move forward. The pandemic has shown that shipping the most efficient and cost-effective method of international transportation that carry more than 80% of global trade remains the leading facilitator of global trade. Therefore, shipping and maritime will be at the heart of the economic recovery, both at the sea and the shore. In this respect, the shipping and the seafarers need to be fully supported so they can concentrate to fulfill their noble responsibilities. Digitalization, big data, and new technologies such as artificial intelligence are keys in enabling the post-COVID recovery and taking shipping into this new era. Increased data collection, processing, interconnectivity capability, enable automated systems to be controlled remotely or through artificial intelligence. Increased automation in shipping has the potential to enhance safety, to improve environmental performance, and to enable more cost-effective shipping. IMO is working to ensure shipping can embrace the digital revolution while ensuring safety, environmental protection, as well as cyber security. Digitalization and new technologies will also be the key to allowing standardization and therefore enhancing the efficiency of shipping. Knowing the many challenges awaiting shipping and international trade, IMO is working to ensure the adoption of technologies that increase the connectivity and efficiency of working practices in maritime transport and ship management, be it in maritime communication or the exchange of information 
and the ship to ship as well as ship to shore interfaces, including through the so-called single window concept. Cooperation between shipping port logistics will be vital for enhancing the efficiency and sustainability of shipping, therefore facilitating trade and fostering economic recovery and prosperity. Communication, cooperation, and collaboration are keys to our success. And I appreciate in particular the enhanced participation and the contribution of our member states, but also of the shipping and the port industry in facilitation committee of the IMO. Standardization and harmonization of procedure for stay and departure of ships are central to IMO's facilitation convention. Ports are at the center of this. National authorities need to work with the ports to ensure the relevant infrastructure and the software system are in place. I'm sure you all aware that since April last year, it has been mandatory under the file convention for ships and ports to exchange arrival departure data electronically. I'm happy to see that international port actively responded with the development of maritime single windows, such as the distal port at SG in Singapore. IMO has also developed the IMO compendium as a tool for software developers who designed the system needed to support the transmission, receipt, and response via electronic exchange of information required for the arrival, stay, and departure of ships, person, and cargo in or from a port. By harmonizing the data elements required during a port call and by the standardizing electronic messages, the IMO compendium facilitate the exchange of information from ships to shore and the interoperability of single windows, reducing the administrative burden for ships. IMO's facilitation committee has established the expert group on data harmonization, recognizing the need for future work. This group is now working toward the harmonization of a data standard in areas beyond the FAL convention, such as exchanging operational data to facilitate just in time operation of ships. The start of this industry collaboration we are witnessing today is aligned with the IMO's efforts to enable interoperability across the maritime platform. After signing, I hope that the parties can help support the industry in harmonizing standards to make the clearance process for ships safer, more reliable, and more efficient. Capitalizing on technological advances will be a simple and effective way to make shipping and the whole supply chain much more efficient for more than 11 billion tons of goods that are traded annually by sea across the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, despite these unprecedented circumstances, it is of utmost importance to not only do everything in our power to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on shipping, international trade and seafarers, but also to progress on our most important policy issues, including enhancing the efficiency of shipping. Maritime transport is and will remain a vital global link in supporting sustainable international trade. And that is because whatever else may happen, one thing is certain, the movement of raw materials energy and transport of manufacturers goods and products between continents would not be possible without maritime transport. And these are things on which sustainable recovery and the growth will depend. I can assure that IMO is ready to establish new partnership 
for cooperation and the sustainable economic recovery for the benefit of all humankind. With this, I would like to thank Singapore for initiating this highly important and a timely maritime perspective online event series, providing an opportunity to discuss and to shape the future of things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sajjan. Though life as we know it came to quite a standstill in the many parts of the world in the recent months, maritime activities persist. And we managed to share our vision of a world of seamless data exchange with several kindred partners. Our many conversations across different time zones have accumulated in a memorandum of understanding, stating our commitment to collaborate on the development and adoption of common data standards and common application programming interface specifications to facilitate information sharing, documentation submission, and transaction of port and maritime services. The six partners of this MOU are Solution Provider for the Global Shipping Business Network's Cargo Smart, Trade Lens represented by GTD Solutions, Calassa represented by PSA as Port Operator, and GTS as Solution Provider, as well as Port of Rotterdam Authority and Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. And the signing will be witnessed by MPA's Chairman and IMO Sekjen. organize a webinar on this a very exciting year we're going to head in towards too. You know, what I like to uh, kind of call to mind is that, uh, you know, I was listening to intently with the chairman of MPA, Mr. Nam, talking about the growing calls uh, for, from an international level for greater standardization. And, and we all know that progressively right now, as we speak, many nations are already in their own pace and their own time are uh, in similar developments to make this happen in terms of putting in place systems that will help in terms of collecting data and making it work. And then we switch, kind of switch um, um, tech and we move into uh, Mr. Lim Kitak, the Secretary General for the IMO uh, uh, organization. And, and he talks a little bit more about right now is a time where we are seeing an unprecedented collaboration among the shipping community. And it's right and it's true because we have to tap on that. Uh, we have to make sure that we look at um, getting data being operated and being seamlessly put in place, regardless of where you are and regardless of what you do. And it was very pleasing to, to hear about the concept called digital ocean. Uh, it's a vision that's in place. And I think that vision is wonderful because we all know that we all live in our own pace and time. And different operators will probably have to rely on their own different systems to work on. And <clears throat> having a digital ocean serves as a common platform for all this to work. So <clears throat> I think without further ado, I have a panel, first panel, that um, I, in the thick of it all, uh, they have been working in the background towards uh, making standardization work and how do they facilitate a whole group and raw data that's in place. I think we all know, right, 11 billion tons of goods 
are transported across the sea annually. I, I cannot imagine the uh, voluminous amount of paperwork and data that needs to be in place. So I think without further ado, I'm going to introduce my first panel. His name is Mr. Shun Hao Jie. And Mr. Shun Hao Jie has been the acting chief technology officer of GETS. And as you know, GETS is the current system integrator for one of the uh, solution provider as well as systems for Callista, which is a cargo logistics inventory streaming and trade aggregation platform. So without further ado, uh, Ms. Shun, go ahead and share with us some of the things you're going through in terms of of uh, picking up and putting in place sockets as well as plug-ins for data to be standardized. Should please go ahead. Thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. It's my privilege to be one of the panelists here in this event. So as a representative of GETS. Today, I will share our perspective on the topic of common data standards and global trade. GETS mission is powering global trade connectivity, but we don't physically ship goods. We deal with only data to help traders to fulfill a shipment. One example of how data can really affect or enhance trade flow, there are situations in which goods have arrived, but the data has not. Thus, customs can't clear goods in time. This puts the stopper to the flow. We also see a downstream planning using the same data. For example, import declaration planning influence the physical cargo stuffing at the origin. We deal with data in the trade and supply chain in Singapore and beyond from government mission critical systems to application used by businesses. As a result, we deal with different data standards around the world. Due to the advancement in technology, our world is more connected. As a result, we see two shift. First, more and more goods are being shipped around the world. More businesses collaborate to produce a product. As usual, shippers need to know about where my goods are, when are they arriving, but the But the second shift is our patience for receiving information has greatly reduced. Nowadays, it is much easier for systems to communicate with each other, such that the human in front of computer on handphone is able to get certain information real time. You probably heard about electronic data or file exchange. They transfer through different protocols, email attachment, SFTP or API. The content can be in delimited format, artifact, XML, and nowadays people refer as JSON. Our focus for today the standard about this exchange. When systems communicate, they follow a standard. In Lamentum's a standard, a data standard defines how information should be included and how it can be understood. When two systems understand the standard, it is much easier for both to exchange information. Let me put this in perspective. If both systems use the same standard, processing the data will be very quick as both understand the same language. But if they don't, it can take which for the translators to translate the language before the other machine can understand. The translators are people typically like the business analysts, the mappers, the developers. So imagine similar content from different parties use different standards. This is a lot of effort. And ended up everyone will be fighting to push through this format to be followed. Those with muscle will eventually win. When we develop solutions, we always follow an industry standard. Let me give you an example of our trade facilitation platform developed for governments such as customs. We always follow data standards set by international bodies such as WCO, IMO, and IATA. In the long run, it makes it easier for government to exchange data with other governments or private sector. When solution providers like this follow a standard from governing body, it adds to our credibility. The governing body usually has a team to review and enhance the standard. WCO releases a new version every year or so. Thus, we keep up with the WCO standard. When we sell our products to customs in different countries, they feel more confident when the product adheres to WCO standards. Although having standards can help the industry to be more efficient, we also understand there are challenges to have a unified standard. So even though WCO implemented standards as different countries are at different level of technology readiness, there are still different standards. As GET's mission is to power global trade and knowing if this hurdle to businesses, we did the tedious work to integrate with over 60 custom nodes. This, through GETS, businesses can quickly set up the data exchange with the local system. Thus, they will be able to use original set of data and pre-populate the document required by the local governments. Although example is, another example is booking containers with carriers. GETS has integrated with over 80 carriers around the world. 
international bodies leverage their reach to create a norm in the industry. Likewise, in Singapore, MP has influence over the industry. We are looking forward to having a common data set standards to help industry exchange data more effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Sure, and thank you very much. I think that's that's wonderful. I, I, I hear you talk about the fact that um, GETS has uh, integrated well over 80 companies in terms of uh, putting in place a standardized approach. I, I think we all agree that, uh, you know, the world walks on a different pace. Uh, and I'll come back to you on that question in a short while in regards to how do we move forward to making sure that regardless of where we move towards to with a diff different drum beat, that at the end of the day, we'll be marching together at the same time. Um, my second panelist speaker I'm pleased to, uh, to invite to, to speak is uh, Mr. Thomas Sprout. And Thomas has been a, uh, a senior advisor as well as a director at TradeLens. Uh, and I think you all know TradeLens is a well-known platform that's been operated by major lines like MERS. Uh, and uh, I think what, what we want to do is to hear from Thomas um, what has been experienced like in terms of uh, getting together a community of people that support MERSC. And even not just only MERS, but other companies as well that are in this trade lens uh, uh, operating model. So, Thomas, without further ado, I'm going to have you uh, go ahead and share with the uh, the audience on on your learning points here. Thank you. Great, thank you, and and thank you for the Port Authority for putting this together, and uh, for the other panelists for sharing their ideas. Um, yeah, it's quite often that government policy, global policies lag technology. And what we're seeing, it is going to be vitally important for the business community to come together to work with the standards bodies to help develop these standards uh, if we're going to achieve what we want to achieve with the, this technology. Um, so on the next slide, we talk about uh, describing trade lens as being a global uh, open and neutral platform. It's meant for all parties in the ecosystem to work together to share data. Uh, it's a permission platform. So parties are invited onto the platform to uh, join the ecosystem. So they're known parties and entities to each other. So it, it's secure. Um, but the key to all of this is to merge the technology with the standards. Um, the technology that's used in uh, single windows in port community systems is very similar technology to what's used in a global platform such as TradeLens. Interoperability will be the key. I think we all agree with that. Um, so improving to work towards standards uh, with all of the bodies, uh, IMO included, uh, we work together with our partners that we're connected with already such as uh, PSA and Port of Rotterdam. Uh, so to develop the standards is the only way we're going to achieve the scale that we need to achieve. Uh, and I think Shun pointed out that uh, this, these exchanges need to become automated, real time, high speed. And to do that, they have to be based on standards. Um, <clears throat> in the next slide, we uh, describe the uh, the way TradeLens has structured this, so we have 122 different type of events, not just actual events, um, but planned and estimated events. So as we look towards the future, uh, the ability of an entire ecosystem to work together to estimate when events are going to happen, to plan together when cargo can be available on a terminal, when it can be picked up by a trucker or brought to a warehouse, uh, all of this can come together with this technology if we're all using the, the same standards. Uh, the platform also has identified the 18 most prevalent type of documents that are used in our industry. So going a bit further to digitize trade, uh, I think one of the lessons certainly of, of COVID is uh, governments quickly coming to the forefront to reduce paper touches within the communities to improve the safety of the, of the community and digitizing documents is certainly part of that. Uh, and then storing this information in a secure manner in blockchain is going to be uh, critical to be able for people to have highly trusted transactions and shared on a platform. Um, so on the next slide, we talk about the uh, 
the products specifically that would be used to support this. So as we mentioned, uh, governments are, are now looking for solutions as to how to reduce the touches by their authorities and by their community members. Uh, so the creation of a digital bill of lading uh, that can be accepted uh, by buyers and sellers, by banks and by governments uh, is, is a product that we're currently testing right now in, in the market. And it's, uh, there's a lot of excitement around that in, in terms of being able to eliminate the paper portion of this trade to uh, reduce unnecessary demerge and certainly reduce uh, the uh, currying of documents uh, globally that tend to get lost. So uh, not only are, are these, all of this is kicked off by the standards of starting with the vessel movement and the vessel entry into a port, which feeds the local community systems, which then enables the planned and estimated events in the ecosystem to be shared. Um, <clears throat> progressing that further, enabling shipping instructions to become bill of ladings is also part of our vision to digitize documents along with certificates that uh, many governments use to uh, for phytosanitary uh, veterinary uh, clearances. Um, and all of this, and it was mentioned previously by, by Shun, uh, rightly so, uh, standard APIs that is the start of all of these transactions uh, in a high speed manner. Uh, so the vessel entry being standardized, connected to port community systems and platforms via APIs, uh, is where we see that the future is, is taking us. And I think this uh, forum comes at the exact right time uh, to support this uh, key initiative. So thank you. Well, Thomas, thank you very much. Um, I definitely uh, am very intrigued and I'm, su I'm sure the audience that are listening in also very intrigued with what has been taking place with Trade Lens because we all know that uh, Trade Lens is right now in full operation and it's been proven and it's worked before. I think, I think bearing which, you know, you, you had talked a little bit about the, uh, you know, about the fact that there needs to be an API in place. So we will come back to you on that in a short while. Uh, and, um, you know, right now it's interesting because we've got two presenters that came before us, uh, Shun, talking about the as an systems integrator challenges he's facing in terms of standardization, how they have to put it in place in that manner. And then we have Thomas who just finishes uh, sharing about, you know, having in place an operational framework, trade lens that is uh, right now being used across multiple parties from the point of the goods being packed in place and then moving forward. And then he mentioned something about a digitalized bill of lading, which is EBL. So I thought maybe it's timely that we ask uh, and invite Mr. Lo Sin Yong uh, who is a director or was been, has been a director of the Infocom Media Development Authority since 2018. And he's very much focused on uh, using ICM technologies uh, to, to get things done. And, and honestly, if, I, if there's no other person that I felt uh, has a lot more background to share with us on what it takes and, and what are the challenges being faced when you begin to think about how do we digitalize EBLs? How do we gain that trust? That, that a digital document can be substituted and can be used as a negotiable instrument. So with that, I think let me introduce now uh, Mr. Lo Sinyong to go ahead and share with us uh, what he has to say. Sinyong, please. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for the short intro. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's actually a pleasure to be here today um, to share with uh, everyone here uh, one of the initiatives that IMD is putting on with specific focus uh, in digitizing one uh, notoriously difficult um, piece of document, which uh, we term it uh, negotiable instrument. And um, next, uh, just a short intro about um, who IMD is. IMD is actually a statutory board in the Singapore government under the Ministry of Communication and Information. As a regulatory body, we oversee the imp and implement policies related to the ICT, media and poster industries in Singapore. We also run the personal data protection 
as well as the protection from online falsehood and manipulation of this. In addition to our government role, IMDA is also responsible driving Singapore's digital transformation through the use of uh, ICT technologies. We work closely with private organizations in various sectors, such as manufacturing, trade and logistics, of course, uh, maritime, transportation, and many others to spearhead the strategic use and adoption of Infocom technology as a key enabler to enhance Singapore's economic uh, competitiveness. Next, please. So everyone knows COVID-19 has brought about unprecedented impact to the global and local economy. To meet business continuity and daily life needs through this challenging period, we have seen a wider embrace for e-commerce and digital tools among businesses and citizens. This shift in mindset and behavior presents an opportunity to drive more widespread and deeper digitalization among individuals and businesses. In trade, these are just some of the top of the mind concerns of businesses around the world and all are looking to governments to take action. Next, please. So the name of our initiative for the project that uh, currently we are working on is the name Take Trust. Uh, as the name suggests, it's about digitalizing trust as um, how Michael put it just now. Next slide. To elevate paperless trade to the next level, we believe that the better way is that is fast, cheap, and easy for thousands of digital silos globally to interoperate is needed. The key here is interoperability. We do this by focusing on the two key factors that resisted digitalization since the invention of electronic networks that allow organizations to exchange business data electronically. They are inefficient processes and fragmented systems, be it electronic system or manual system. International supply chain today typically involve many parties with sets of documents that are handed over from one actor to another along the value chain. To cater for the different degree of digital readiness of each of these sectors, we need to interoperate not only with digital systems but also to interoperate between human and machine and between hard copy and digital documents. Next slide, please. From the past experience of our involvement in numerous trade digitalization projects, we have learned that the solution to cross-border paperless trade is not a technical one. Uh, the solutions need to be an embodiment of business needs, standardization, law, and technology. The set of software components that, and tools that we build is just a manifestation of this embodiment. Legal harmonization looks at the relevant legislations that are needed to facilitate cross-border paperless trade. For example, the Model Law on Electronic Transferable Records, published by the United Nations Commission for International Trade Law, is a legislative standard that enable electronic negotiable instruments to be valid legally. Singapore has already announced that we will be amending our Electronic Transactions Act by the second half of 2021 and incorporating this model law into our own legislation. This is just less than 12 months away. Standard developments deal with the creation and enhancement of technical and process standards at international bodies such as the United Nations Center for E-Business and Trade Facilitation and the ISO, including IMO, of course, where it is done in collaboration with experts from all over the world. Accreditation is an optional feature within the MLEPR, which would give certainty in regards to the applicability of the law. Last but not least, the trade trust software components are designed for organizations to easily integrate and deploy onto their existing IP infrastructure so as to extend interoperability beyond one's respective digital uh, community. At the start of our digital trade journey, two years ago, we studied the numerous proof of concept out there and distilled our key learnings into five key design principles. 
blockchain is designed for decentralization as such we want to leverage on this unique attribute for cross-border trade because we use public blockchain it is then a must that we keep all data off chain trade trust is designed to be payload agnostic this means that party can make use of whichever format or standard that they already have invested in their IT system by focusing on the business processes. To promote adoption, we are licensing the Trade Trust software components under open source licensing terms, which all source codes to be checked and verified by anyone before use. Lastly, the title trans transfer functionality of Trade Trust is designed to be MLETR compliant. Next slide. It is very important to note that Trade Trust is not a platform. I repeat, it's not a platform. It is a utility that enables a platformless approach to achieving interoperability. And this Trade Trust that we build is not just for Singapore. Over the past two years, we have been working closely with international organizations by contributing what we have built to the global community. We believe the role of government is to invest in infrastructure building including working with various international organizations in establishing global standards. Next slide, please. We need to recognize that digitalizing trade within a single country is not sufficient. Cross-border paperless trade can only be achieved through active dialogues and cooperation among governments and businesses of the world. Singapore is active in various international fora, working with other governments to embrace digital uh, it, trade digitalization, especially in today's age of ever accelerating technology in, innovations. Next slide, please. This is how Trade Trust look like from technical perspective. We have since completed version three of the Trade Trust utility and had demonstrated successfully its ability to transfer ownership of an electronic transferable record or digital document of title between counterparties in Singapore and Rotterdam over a public Ethereum blockchain network. For the very first time, we are witnessing the ability to create an electronic title document on one platform and allow it to be transacted in a peer-to-peer -peer manner across different platforms throughout its life cycle. Next slide. This is an illustration of how interoperability can be achieved with a trade trust for a normal trade document. I will not go too much into detail and uh, skip forward to the next slide for the one of time. The ability to consume, verify, and process just normal trade documents is not enough. We need a way to deal with a class of documents that has resisted digitalization even until today, with or without COVID. Unlike its paper counterpart, we can deal with title ownership and consignment data separately in an electronic original view or leading. In this illustration, the BL data is being shared among participate, participants of the supply chain along the outside dotted ring in the form of a trade trust file. This file can be transported via any conventional means of chain, such as email attachment, portal downloads, APIs, or even secure networks such as SWIFT. Only transactions relating to the change of title ownership will be registered and tracked on chain via a public blockchain network. This architecture, together with the relevant legislative changes that we are putting in place, will allow digital negotiable instruments to be transacted across multiple digital ecosystems without limiting any participants to a single platform. Next slide, please. Trade digitalization is a glo truly global effect, spanning across authorities, associations, and businesses. Since its inception, our approach to solving the paperless trade problem had garnered interest from many parties. Just in January this year, at the sidelines of World Economic Forum in Davos, a multilateral MOI was in, comprises multinationals from the East and the West to further our collaborative effort to digitize trade. Next slide. Our work is currently published under outsourced license at GitHub. We encourage any interested party to explore and make use of it if it is of value to you. We are now reaching out to the global community to walk the journey with us. Thank you. For this, I return the floor to Michael.
So, John, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, definitely, uh, for sure, you know, the, the idea of uh, having a document that can be trusted and, and that can be ex also accepted by multiple parties across borders will be very important for all of us. Um, you know, I'm seeing uh, questions uh, coming in fast and furious. I'm very happy that the audience are picking it up. Obviously, there are pretty much a lot of the things uh, uh, that they are sharing. There are a few comments which I tend to agree. So I'm going to probably begin with, um, let me just go ahead and ask the first question to the panel. Uh, and, and, and maybe this is something that I'm going to ask um, uh, Thomas first. And then we'll pick up from there of the written Q&A that's coming in from the audience itself. Thomas, you know, as an example, and could you share with us uh, what are the key pain points today uh, that you have seen in regards to global trade and supply chain information visibility? I mean, how could data standards really help? You, you know, Trade Lens, like I said, has been operating, but I am also certain there are many other platforms similar to Trade Lens that are also operating as well. And, and obviously, we know that goods will transact back and forth. And at some point in time, somewhere in this whole universe of all of this data that's taking place, um, other systems like trade lands would interject somehow. And, and so, you know, from your perspective, what, what do you think, you know, what, what are the key pain points that you see today that can actually be addressed? Thomas, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And uh, it, it's an excellent point. Uh, I think, it, I would say there's two areas. So the technology is enabling so much innovation today that it's really, it was pointed out in some of the earlier videos, it's really ramping up quite a bit. Everyone wants to be part of it. I think APIs is an area where we must develop the standards very quickly before the excitement around the development becomes local and is harder to corral. So I think Focusing on the standards of, of the APIs is, is really a, a good place to start, uh, number one. And number two, I think uh, there's a mindset shift that has to happen in regards to the willingness to share data for the benefit of the broader ecosystem. Uh, it's so important. Uh, so people put a lot of work into developing the data, but uh, data becomes much more important when it is shared with an ecosystem, but the whole purpose of Port community systems is to increase cargo velocity through the port. That is done much better when it moves from information that's available on a site versus planned and estimated uh, events to match up with the actual. So I would say the API standards and the willingness to share is uh, are, are the two areas I think we can focus on. Well, okay. I mean, that, that sounds, you know, that sounds like a good plan and, and, and I'm seeing on the, uh, the Q&A portion, people are polling and uh, deciding which are the more popular questions. I thought maybe I want to ask a second one, um, which I think probably pretty much similar to what I was going to ask the panel anyway. And, and that is, uh, you know, for blockchain, I think all of us agree that um, today as we look at it, um, it's been almost, what, uh, three, four years since blockchain has been uh, mooted and has been introduced to the industry itself. Uh, but we, we do see blockchain um, uh, being existing today with multiple parties with different types of blockchain community. So it's again like my community of blockchain uh, doesn't really talk to either community of blockchain unless we put in place a bridge like an API for us to move data in, in that manner. Uh, but I think the question that's been asked here right now is this, uh, is number one is how do blockchain technology, how can it be leveraged unless there is a standardization of blockchain interoperability and that needs to be achieved. So I think this question, I'm not going to pose to you, Thomas, I'm going to pose to uh, Shun, who is an SI, a systems integrated developer for Callista, and I'm sure he knows a lot more about this than any one of us do. Shun, go ahead. What is your viewpoint? Do you think yeah. that that can be achieved? Um, well, we have our own blockchain product called the Open Trade Blockchain. And we are also a participant in a lot of blockchain initiatives, as, as an example. So true enough, I think that's what you mentioned, the current technology itself uh, from blockchain perspective, it doesn't really offer, at least to my knowledge, a true interoperability. Everyone has their own blockchain network. And as you rightfully mentioned, you need to bridge somehow these different networks. I, I believe you know, it is really through the approach uh, as well as envisioned by IMD through the trade trust 
is something that would help enable and sort of um, accelerate that aspect. Uh, not really imposing a platform, but rather providing a utility that is open enough, embracing the open source as well, you know, for people to participate in. And I think ultimately, the key factor is also what Thomas mentioned, is really the willingness to participate and to share that information. Right now, everyone has a different network, um, you know, and, and to a certain extent, they are really sort of safeguarding the data perspective and really sharing this within their own ecosystem of partners. If everyone can be a little bit more open, that would actually make a big difference. Well, that's that's good, uh, Shun. You know, um, and 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 which leads me to another question, which I thought was really really good. Has been posted on the site here, and they talk about the fact that. You know, standardization work is very time consuming, very time intensive. You know, how, how could we speed up these works despite the fact that we have also need to respect uh, international framework for common standards? You know, you heard SecGen uh, of IMO talk about an international standard, the FAL Convention, um, in, in, in order for us to achieve a high acceptance across the board. So we've heard Chairman of MPA talking about the fact that there must be seamless interoperability. I think we've been hearing those a lot. So, you know, this is going to be the, the flavor of the year that's coming in place. So I think, you know, at this point in time, perhaps I'm going to open up to the, uh, the, the three panelists, whether it's Thomas, is it Sin Yong, or is it Yu Shun to, to talk this through? What, what do you guys think, panelists? Don't be in a rush to answer, I know. <laughs> Thomas? Um, yeah, I, I think it, uh, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. So I think this is a very good first step to come together um, to create that standard for the very beginning part of the process for all of us, which is on the vessels and the vessel entry, bring that into local community systems and uh, building the, the standards from there. So uh, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of good work being done by the broader bodies. And I think the business needs to now make that uh, transactional. Okay, um, you know, that maybe was... I share my experience. Go ahead, Sunil. Yes. Actually, if you look at uh, standardization, really, uh, I agree uh, with the audience that uh, uh, Jonathan or is, is it Jonathan that posted this question? Or someone else? Never mind. It's, it's really a time, time consuming uh, um, endeavor. Uh, why I say that is because if you look at the container uh, liner trade, uh, one of the most uh, widely used uh, EDI standard available today is BayPli. Uh, that is an uh, artifact uh, standard for exchanging of Bay plan. And um, I remember when I first came across BayPli, that was 25 years ago. And it took the industry 25 years to reach uh, the wide acceptance of BayPli, like what you see today. Mm. So there is a important uh, key learning here is that we need to distinguish between formatting the data according to a certain way versus understanding the data that is sent across the network. Not so long ago, artifact is suspended. Then we move on to XML. Then now we JSON. And we also need to uh, be mindful that the systems or platform uh, were built over a period of time under different architecture. So that is the reason why if, if let's say we uh, uh, need to have a very strict and specific way how data can be formatted and what transport uh, uh, protocol is used to actually uh, uh, send across two different systems, uh, that is very challenging. So that is the reason why if, if you look at the way Tetris is designed, we are not saying that there's no standard. Just that we recognize that the fact that in the industry today, there are many, many standards. Mm. Even WCO uh, data model that gets users has version update every year. So if my system is uh, created based on uh, the, the version this year, then another system built next year, can these two systems talk? Although at the high level, yes. But when you come to the bits and pieces, the bits and bytes, uh, it's not, uh, sometimes you run into problems. So this is uh, just the experience uh, that, that, that I would like to share. May I well, Yeah, go ahead, Shun. Yeah, um, it does take time, right? And I think with that whole governing body that's been assembled over the decades, helps a lot. As you can see, the WCO and IMO 
have a lot of participations and things are done over years. And what Sinyong has roughly said, you know, there are versions being published every time as well because things are changing and we need to adapt to the change. Nonetheless, well, we already have a lot of data standards and we're not starting from ground zero. It's not a green field, right? There are things out there that we need to leverage. It's really more of a concerted effort that we need to come together and, you know, don't do things that are overlapping, right? Rather collaborate towards the same common goal and do it progressively. There's no way you can do a big bang, right? It's either you target a certain industry for the shipment aspects or you target a certain group of people to participate first, the movers, the, basically the influencers. And over time, it'll be like a ripple effect, right? People will start to adopt it. So data standards are already there, right? We have technology standards protocol for data exchanges. It's just a matter of how do you marry them together for our business purposes. All right, good. So, you know, thank you. Look, um, I, I'm seeing a lot more questions coming in fast and fierce and firing, but I, I know they will be answered in due time. So what I want to do is that... Uh, I want to move to the next panel because the second panels, I want to keep them warm, get them ready to go um, because what they're going to share and also maybe towards uh, at the end of the presentation, we will also have all of these questions being answered. So keep them coming. Thank you so much for the audience. Uh, I'm going to hand over to, to Dawn uh, for, her, for her to introduce to you the second panel uh, because I think the, the sharing they're going to be having will be very similar and I'm sure some of these questions being posted out there will likely be answered by their presentations itself. Dawn, over to you for a short uh, introduction towards the second panel, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. And thank you, Hao Jie, Thomas, and Xin Yong for the excellent start. And thank you so much for audience for your really a lot of questions coming in, but we may not be able to group them and have them answered by the first panelist, uh, as what Michael has said. So maybe uh, we will segue to the second one and see what other questions that we can answer, all right? So um, at one point in time, we have about 260 of you guys uh, you know, joining us for this webinar. Thank you so much for coming in from different time zones to join us, okay? Now, the second panel will now tackle the question, how ready are regulators and ports to digitalize port ship processes and embrace enablers of data exchange such as APIs? Michael, over again to you, please. And then the second uh, panel of, uh, of our friends joining us. Over to you, Michael. Don, thank you very much. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I think the key word is, is pretty much uh, how ready are the regulators and the ports, yeah, uh, these two parties. And, and also really very much how do you enable, how do you enable data processes exchange? I think that's pretty much the second part that it's, I'm seeing it apparently appearing in all the questions that's coming in fast and furious. Yeah, so I think without further ado, you know, this morning we heard the Secretary General of the IMO talk about the fact that at the IMO itself, they are very serious about this. They want to see this happen. Uh, there's a FEL convention and the FEL committee has been in place. So I think what better and who better than to share with us on what's happening at the, uh, at the FEL committee itself is, uh, I'm going to introduce Julian, Julian Abril. He is the head of facilitation at IMO and uh, is the secretary for the committee of F facilitation itself. And, and I think very much more importantly is the fact that, you know, you will hear from, from, from Julian, what are the things that IMO is doing? What, are, what have they anticipated and what will they want to see in terms of making sure internationally as we grow with a living, living document, how will this then, then fall into place into a much more concerted effort to make it worthwhile and work as a uniform level of platform moving forward? Julian, over to you. Many thanks, uh, Michael. Very good morning to all. And um, in particular, I would like to express my appreciation to Singapore for uh, offering the opportunity to participate in this very important event regarding the uh, signing of the MOU. Uh, please let me um, first um, recall that the, as the Secretary General of the IMO has mentioned in his opening remarks, the COVID-19 crisis has highlighted the critical importance of facilitation of international maritime traffic, as well as the digitalization for the sustainability of the global supply chain. Electronic exchange of information and single window concept have been a way for IMO to address facilitation. As you may be aware, from April 2019, all exchange of information imports should be uh, 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 using systems for the electronic exchange of information. In addition, the FAL Convention encourages the use of the single window concept to enable all the information requ re required by public authorities in connection with arrival, stay, and departure of ships, 
persons are cargo to be submitted by via a single portal without duplication. Uh, please uh, uh, let me um, raise your attention that there is currently under discussion in the FAL committee the possibility to amend the FAL convention to make uh, the use of the single window compulsory, as, they, as in a similar way as it was made some years ago when it was decided to make compulsory the electronic exchange of information. To date, many countries have developed multiple single windows addressing the needs for different authorities. There are uh, single windows for customs, immigration, border management, and so on. So trade still needs uh, to submit the same information more than once to several single windows. In this respect, in order to facilitate the change of information, ship to shore and ensure the interoperability of single windows or different systems, the IMO has developed the IMO Compendium on Facilitation and Electronic Business. The Compendium is a tool for software developers that harmonizes the data elements required for regulatory purpose under the FAR Convention, the, the so-called the FAL forms, during a port call and standardizes electronic messages, reducing administrative burden for ships linked to formalities and ports. The IMO Compendium is not supposed to be a new standard as such, but rather the tool to harmonize standards, existing standards. The goal is to make it easier for companies involved in maritime trade or transport to create software that can communicate no matter which standard they are based on. So far, the IMO compendium consists of an IMO data set and an IMO reference data model, which cover the information, information requirements under the FAL convention. To expand the scope of the uh, IMO compendium, the Facilitation Committee established the Expert Group on Data Harmonization in 2019. This group is responsible for the technical maintenance of the IAMO Compendium and for further expanding its data sets and data model to areas beyond the FAL Convention. The Expert Group brings together IAMO member states, the main international standard organization involved in electronic exchange of information, uh, such as WCO, UNIC, ISO, IHO, or IALA. Also uh, involves uh, the industry and key uh, NGOs and maritime related standard organizations. It is an example of a great collaboration. The IMO, the WCO, NEC and ISO uh, has uh, signed a partnership to support increased maritime digitalization and to support the, the maintenance of the IMO data model. As mentioned, the IMO compendium is growing to include additional data including uh, operational port and shipping data, like timestamps. In 2019, in the first uh, meeting of the expert group, the group approved the new data set related to the just-in-time concept, among, among other data uh, sets. How it works in practice uh, and this uh, maintenance? The IAMO, I mean, through the FAL committee with the assistance of the expert group, discusses and approves new data sets submitted by industry and member states with data elements and their definitions and amendments uh, to the IAMO reference data model. The mapping between the IAMO compendium and the standard is not a responsibility of IAMO, it's a work made by the, each standard organization. This was the case with WCO, ISO and UNEC. When we discussed the uh, IMO compendium, we agreed on common standards and definitions, and later on, each uh, uh, standard organization have made um, changes and have uh, made mapping to their standards to align it with the IMO compendium. Any organization responsible for a standard or a data model in the scope of a ship approaching call, uh, calling a port is welcome to add and map data in the IMO compendium. The incentive to work with the IMO is that uh, if it is not harmonized, any work that you can develop on standards would have limited scope, local or national or regional. But if it is included and discussed in the IMO and included in the IMO compendium, that will allow that uh, uh, um, interoperability, that anyone connect to your system. This facilitates the interconnection between systems at the international level and therefore expands the potential of any tools. This is the importance of working in the scope of the IAMO. I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today to explain the work of uh, what IAMO is doing on facilitating digitalization of data change ship to port and on harmonizing standards. 
We hope to continue this good cooperation with industry, member states and international standard organizations. And I, uh, I encourage you to participate in the work of the expert group. Thank you very much, Michael, over to you. Julian, thank you very much. And, and again, I, I feel, and I personally feel that uh, having IMO be part of this whole uh, thought leadership and spearheading the initiative is going to be very important for all of us um, because you know already you've, we've seen from the Q&A being posted everyone is afraid everyone is questioning and scoffing at the idea that we don't think standards are going to work you know everyone's going to go on separate uh, paths moving forward we're going to have a disjointed community altogether but I think we'll you have an opportunity to answer that in a short while but I think right now what I want to do is to introduce uh, uh, Paul, Paul Walter, who is the uh, who is currently in the port of Rotterdam as the senior uh, uh, director and head of digital strategy and technology innovation data officer at Port of Rotterdam, and and who better than to talk about this because as you know, Port of Rotterdam is a very busy port, uh, and you know we we have seen some of the Q and A's been posted out there. You know, I I think Paul's uh, sharing would likely maybe put some uh, perspective into what people are thinking about and and what their doubts are. So Paul, without further ado. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, Michael, very much for this introduction. And thank you, Julian, for the uh, very uh, clear presentation uh, just, just prior to this one. And uh, it's, it's really an honor to be on this, uh, on, on this webinar. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Um, Port of Rotterdam. Uh, Port of Rotterdam being the uh, gateway to Europe with uh, 500 million consumers to be reached within 25 hours, 24 hours with our barge, our trains, our um, trucks and of course our short sea. And to do all this, to receive the ships, to do the clearance, to link the logistics. Nowadays already we have 270,000 uh, messages uh, a day, uh, adding up to over uh, 100 uh, million messages a year. So nowadays we are more, uh, not only a logistics hub, but already becoming a data hub to Europe as well. And being already an almost uh, paperless port, uh, that's only half of the solution. We should do this together. We should make this handshake because trade, of course, is flowing from the one side of the uh, globe to the other side. And we believe that uh, digital now has become mature enough to make this next step to make the real seamless journey for the cargo owners which is of course uh, the means in the end and of course the the logistic service providers and the platform players they will deliver the services but they will need this data from uh, the ships arriving the data from the clearance but also the data within the ports because the role of ports uh, has been shifting and nowadays we are have a broader role we are not only doing the uh, the landlord of the the port area and the safety of the of the of the of the the vessels arriving nowadays we have an important role and it's not only rotterdam i, I see it spreading an important role of this linkage of uh, sea and land and from planning perspective, that's a very uh, complex uh, element. Um, you see, of course, the planning of, of, of the ships to optimize the port, uh, the clearance, but also the, the, the cargo being transferred to uh, barges, trains, short sea. And even like in Rotterdam, we are now even handling also operationally uh, the transport between the, 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 the terminals. So this all together is, is a set of information that especially in this next phase, after this first phase that we're entering now together as a consortium, is very relevant to, uh, to get to the seamless uh, uh, journeys in the supply chain. And I can foresee that uh, there will be a lot of AI being used to have this uh, reliable and predictable experience for the cargo owners in the end. Uh, for us, the um, uh, global alignment on, on common data standards has, has basically four levels. So we start at the data level, but we think upward there's another level of of, of uh, not only the definitions, but also the models and the, the, the defining of the quality that's required. And on, of course, uh, adding up with the interoperability and the, and the, the surface functionality it, uh, itself. 
and we would prefer uh, uh, bodies like the the IMO uh, to not only stay in the the, 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 the the bottom level of definitions but really move on in the the data models and the quality levels to do this together uh, we have quite some good experience in that uh, already a few years ago we started a somewhat similar journey but only for the for the port call itself to optimize the port call uh, all ports having this different history with completely different definitions and in this journey we harmonized uh, just very basic definitions like time of arrival like the depth like the birding place to make that similar all over uh, the ports and we experienced that uh, doing it together with this standardization body, it, it, it really speeded up instead of hindered. That was one of our key, uh, key learnings in that, uh, that experience. And finally, regarding the, the, uh, the panel statements, um, how mature are, 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 are the, the authorities to make this next step? I think the Maritime single window really helped to make steps. But on the other hand, we also see that especially the small ports, the small ports are really, do not have enough IT resources to making these next steps. And I think also there the, the IMO could, uh, could, could help to really prioritize which standards should be addressed first. It would be more easy for small ports to handle this as a package to outsource it to their IT partners to get on the same, uh, same page. And of course, not all ports have to, to invent the wheel themselves. I think we're moving now in, 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 in an age where we really should join together and also use uh, um, uh, the, the combined capacity. Why not should one port use the surfaces already defined with another uh, port as a surface? We're moving there as a Rotterdam and we see other ports moving there as well. And I think that's uh, very beneficial to speed up. So I'm uh, very much looking forward to, uh, to working together in this uh, consortium. Coming back to you, uh, Michael. Thank you, Paul. I think I think you've made it quite clear, right? Um, uh, you know, evidently, of course, um, there are there are so many ports in the world. Every port has a different level of maturity, a different level of sophistication, and and they all face their own. I call it unexpressed challenges that's in place. Yeah, um, you know, IMO is doing what they can to really spearhead and and maybe put some sensibility in all of this insane madness to rush towards digitalization, uh, you know, a call for standardization. You know, we, we, all, we, all are, we all are excited, but also at the same time fearful of what's coming up ahead. You know, the last thing we want to do is to look at it and say, wow, we've done all we can, but we still can't talk to each other. Um, you know, so that kind of calls me back to uh, what... Um, uh, Mr. Lim Kintak was uh, saying early on in his opening address, you know, he, he mentioned about the fact that uh, there is this vision about this whole digital ocean. There's this whole other concept about having the ability to fine tune and perhaps simplify how we do things. That the term calling for a single, a maritime single window, uh, you know, that's going to be pretty important for us. And that's the reason why data harmonization uh, it's going to be important for us to realize that, you know, we heard it from Julian early on and talking about this and how they're going to plan to put it in place for everyone to hopefully to follow through. And, and I think what better way to kind of segue into introducing my, my third uh, speaker for the second panel here, you know, David Fu, uh, who is in the thick of it all. You know, David is the, currently the Senior Director of Operations and Technology at the MPA. Uh, and, and he's right now busily implementing and, and putting in place from an industry perspective, just like what you did, Paul, uh, in the port of Rotterdam, uh, reaching out to the community to put in place a maritime single window where they can start to understand, warm up to it, and start to use it. And hopefully that will generate a kind of a very comforting, you know, a halo effect that would cascade across the entire region and also internationally. So David, on to you. I think I put a, a great introduction for you to move on with this. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael, and I'm really glad, a good day to all of you to be on this panel together with uh, Julian as well as uh, Paul. Indeed, uh, we've talked a lot about digitalization and it's not something new. But I think um, we are all aware that with the COVID situation, this has very much accelerated. And I think that's uh, 
good opportunity for us to really take it forward. So I'm really glad that the MOE has signed, but I think the most important part is really to get to work and to be able to then demonstrate that this is indeed possible and the benefits that we all imagine would actually uh, become true and then to actually galvanize the entire industry, the global shipping industry to really come in to join. So this will benefit all seafarers, uh, the maritime uh, industry as well. And um, I'm glad to have this opportunity. I know that I've only got five minutes, so I've prepared only five slides. And I'd like to give the uh, Singapore's sort of perspective in terms of some of the maritime digitalization efforts that we've been uh, busy at work with. Next slide, please. And we are seeing that uh, actually there's an emerging opportunity to really optimize uh, global port, uh, port calls because this is really something which is a problem statement uh, that's common to many other ports and earlier Paul was, saying, uh, was talking about you know there are large and small ports and different resources given to every different port so I think this is one problem statement which is um, I, uh, very much appropriate to actually tackle and we've worked on many different standards already uh, we need to really increase interoperability across all the different platforms and we don't want to really stick to one standard uh, platform for all so the most important thing uh, and the outcome which I think that we need to aim towards is really to cut down on repeated data entries because that actually takes up a lot of admin time and that also contributes to sustainability. And if we could all digitalize our port clearance processes to be able to then share data across uh, different uh, platforms, that would very much be able to then um, help us uh, on our way to this uh, particular vision. Next slide. In Singapore, uh, we have already embarked on uh, phase one of digital port at SG. Uh, for us, um, we would imagine that every port in the world would be a digital port. So for, for Singapore, because of our unique uh, circumstances and in, in terms of our port uh, regulatory requirements, we have used a single window concept to actually merge three different government agency processes where you used to take 16 different separate forms and, you know, and agents and shipping companies have to actually go into three different separate portals to be able to input the data. We have then amalgated into one single application process. So this really is a tremendous effort. As you can imagine, there will be different work processes uh, across the different agencies. And then we have to get an uh, interagency team to really work at some of these uh, workflows. So indeed, it is a very um, painstaking sort of process, but I think that actually benefits the industry. Uh, it is estimated we could uh, potentially save up to 100,000 man hours uh, really in just phase one. Uh, today, we've onboarded more than 90% of companies with 642 onboarded, and the port clearances through this new platform has already reached a level of 74%. And by the end of uh, August, uh, we hope to reach 100%. Next slide. In phase two, um, beyond just looking at uh, port clearances, we are going to expand the platform. We're going to basically port over the existing 125 uh, e-services that we have in place uh, into the phase two platform. We want to make uh, the, the service more integrated, more seamless for users. And to be able to then do that, we need to actually design the platform to have a very user-centric sort of experience. And we also want to create a one-stop marketplace uh, because that's important. You need to be able to get all the port uh, players, business, uh, users as well as the business service providers into a single sort of platform to offer services. Only in, in that sort of way, uh, then we can actually begin to realize the benefits of just-in-time operations. Because it's not just about scheduling the vessel to come uh, to the port on time, it is to be able to then orchestrate all the services uh, that the vessel expected to, to procure and to utilize within the uh, the entire state of its uh, uh, port call and be able to then minimize all the various uh, loud times in between and in the end it's a win-win situation because the vessels get turned around much quicker and then we will have a greater capacity within our port to then welcome more ships in the future and of course we've talked a, lo a lot more about global interoperability in the next slide i will then describe to you our vision uh, next please in digital oceans, uh, essentially, I think a lot of speakers have talked about it. The most important thing is about using common uh, data exchanges, looking at uh, data models which have already been established. So that's a lot of good work that's already been done. Now it's ready to get it uh, integrated together. As I've said before, we imagine that, that there will be a lot of digital ports around the world. 
with different digital logistics platforms. So the entire maritime transport chain uh, needs to be integrated. Uh, but the most important part is to provide a way, a means to really interoperate it through secure transactions, open sort of data um, uh, exchanges. And this will then engender the trust necessary to enable such uh, data exchanges. My last slide. So in terms of uh, looking at the MOU parties, this is what we envision in terms of the work done. So immediately tomorrow, we will we'll kick start. Uh, we'll be then looking at the certain technical workshops, uh, publish uh, the first batch of APIs uh, early next year, and hopefully develop and progress into different batches of APIs and beyond 2022 to fully reap the benefits of this expansion. And hopefully we'll get a lot more partners within this uh, MOU and we'll see a much more connected, uh, digital and efficient world. Thank you very much. David, thank you. I think, I think your last slide kind of uh, also helps me to prioritize uh, some of the questions that's coming up on the, on the Q&A chat screen. Um, and, and I thought maybe perhaps um, I'm gonna combine um, two questions into one. I'm gonna pose it to Julian. You know, um, you, you talk about, David, you talk about uh, the MOU, surely today we saw that. We have um, witnessed the MOU signing. His, it's historic for us. I, and, and I think having an MOU sign pretty much indicates the commitment that's in place by multiple parties. Um, I think to us, it also lends a level of uh, opportunity to make sure that we can iron out all of the um, hiccups that we can see because, you know, we, we talk about standardization and, and, and we do know that no matter how, there's always that, that inner, inner cynicism that, that says that standardization will never work unless someone just shoves it down the throat, right? Um, so I, I think um, what will happen is that I'm going to combine two questions into one, and I'm going to read it slowly for Julian. And, and it's also reflective of, um, uh, of the Q&A has been asked by the audience. So I'm going to try and paraphrase it as accurate as I can uh, for Julian to answer, right? So... So first of all, uh, the fact is that the IMO is primarily involved in standardization of maritime processes and practices at the global level. Will the IMO also be involved in the standardization of ICT? Uh, and, and how do we message the kind of exchange across the global port system, number one? Linking to that question is um, an example of today we've got treatments. Uh, and it is uh, supported uh, with an API done by DCSA. But while, while GSBN is another platform that competes against trade lands, you know, um, and, and this is apparent because we will always anticipate and will always foresee, foresee this because trade lands is not only just one singular community, there'll be many other communities like a trade land sprouting out all over the world. And, and so then how could, Trade lands uh, or GSBN or even IMO define a common standard uh, that will allow, as, as what Chairman Nam from MP has mentioned before, how do you allow and how do you facilitate a seamless interoperability across the different platforms? And, and so that we can make sure that uh, investments being put in place, you know, by the ports of Rotterdam and Singapore who are trying to marry up five different parties the shippers, the ship owners, the land transport site, the customs officers. You know, how do we make sense of all of this? Honia, up. I'm sorry, difficult question. You have the answer. You're on mute. Unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Michael. Thank you for the questions. You know, regarding the First one, really the priority of IAMO is not to develop uh, own standards. Our priority is to uh, offer their uh, place that the owners of the standards can discuss and to can align their uh, respective uh, uh, standards through alignment of definitions and the data elements and later on of uh, the, data, uh, the data model. Uh, afterwards, it's up to the owners of the standards uh, to um, align and the data standards to um, uh, the common um, agreement made in the, uh, through the, the IAMO compendium. Therefore, um, we are really um, not much interested to participate in the discussion of the standardization as such, but instead of that one to offer that once the standard is the, uh, developed, to offer to present the, the standard 
to, to IMO in order that the other owners of the standards can uh, look at that one and uh, see if it is needed alignment to their own standards. This would guarantee the, the, um, the interoperability between the systems. Regarding the second one, on the, um, uh, I, I understand that uh, the question is related to the main list, uh, to the blockchain and the um, comments made that uh, there are different standards of uh, blockchains or owners of the, the blockchains that really they are not connecting with, between each other and there are some issues. And uh, on that one, I may um, inform you that uh, at uh, IMO, really blockchain has not been discussed in, in detail. It's something that is a new technology that is only the three years old. And uh, the, we see or foresee uh, possibilities to use in, uh, in uh, different um, uh, aspects of the regulatory of the shipping, such as the uh, um, confirmation of or information of uh, uh, standards of competence of seafarers. But this is something that is uh, really is not mature enough at IMO level. Even though uh, I would uh, encourage, I mean, if uh, uh, you, uh, those interested to participate in uh, meetings in the committee on the expert group and to present uh, proposals. I would be more than happy to guide, I mean, any, any discussions uh, in the future. Thank you. I don't know if I have uh, answered your questions. <laughs> Michael, thank you to you. Thank you, Julian. Um, I, I, have, I have two other questions which I thought was very interesting uh, and, and it's, a, it's a good life example. So I, I want to direct this at Paul. Um, uh, Paul, there, there are two questions here which I thought were, were on point. Yeah? Um, you mentioned before you shared with us that, um, wow, it's amazing, Port of Rotterdam, gateway to 500 million end users and customers, you know, and having to ship goods all within 24 hours to clear it all the way through, right? You know, obviously, I think the data standards uh, terminology is being used by land, the rail, trucks, everybody else will be very different from shipping language. Um, how does this really hamper interoperability and efficiency? H how do we overcome that kind of a challenges? You know, even just on terminologies alone, we're not even touching data standards yet, right? So that's the first question. And the second question is the, is the following, you know, Port of Rotterdam is the leading port in global traffic being handled. Is it conceivable to have a global port community system, PCS for short, where all PCS interfaces for message exchange can be achieved in order to have, you know, what we really are looking for, a global seamless integration. So Paul, your, your comments, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, Michael. Well, very interesting questions and we can discuss uh, <laughs> concerning those questions, I think for hours, uh, but I'll try to keep it uh, to the point. Uh, regarding your first questions, um, that's true. The, um, the amount of parties involved in, 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 in global logistics is, is enormous and the standardization demands uh, also on land is, is, is just as... Um, expressing as it is at sea. I always say there are 28 parties involved to get a container mid-Asia to middle Europe. It's incredible, those 28 parties. So, but um, I think the ports, what I said, are on this uh, land-sea um, uh, connection. And that's a logical point to, to, to start. And I think the, the, the clearance processes can help as linking of the language of the sea and the language of the land. Um, so, if you combine that to starting with um, uh, is standardization bodies and making a coalition of the willing that are really do have the, the, the capacity to make steps, I think we're moving the, the right direction. Um, and related to your second question, uh, yes, many uh, ports do have port community systems and that makes them more flexible to, to, to make steps ahead. Um, they have more resources. Uh, however, all those port community systems at this moment also are still optimizing their own region, their own standards, their own uh, processes. Um, and basically there are two directions that, that, that should come together. It's, it's like we are doing now uh, about uh, focusing on interoperability and the port community systems are having a look if at some way 
For, exam for, for example, for identity management, there's a benefit in also connecting the port community systems. And I think this is, will be one of the key questions for the next, uh, next year to answer. Wow, that's that's pretty interesting, you know, and and that kind of leads me to you know, it's kind of natural. I mean, I didn't even plan for this, but um, your your ending statement kind of leads me to the to another question I'm going to pose to David, um, and it's it's on screen right now. It's saying that um, you know, with all of this efforts that we have, digital ocean, maritime single window, digital port at SG, is the um, Singapore digital port uh, concept. Um, how is it integrated with the Customs National Trade Platform? And, and how can digital port be, in a way, integrated with also the other ASEAN uh, countries where they have their own single window? How do you see that taking place, David? Well, thanks, uh, Michael, and thanks uh, for the question from the uh, audience. I think uh, for us, um, indeed, uh, what's important is that we will definitely be linking with the network uh, trade platform, uh, the NTP, uh, in Singapore itself. So essentially, um, by early next year, we will have uh, data exchange uh, protocols between NTP and digital of uh, port. And this will then enable data flows uh, between the customs functions as well as the regular functions uh, in MPA. Now, going uh, beyond uh, just uh, digital port as a SG, um, I would say that uh, the digital ocean sort of vision is really to be able to then connect um, whichever port is willing to then um, participate within this uh, exercise of trying to be able to send data across different regions. We are not starting up coal. We have already started uh, certain uh, prototypes with, for example, uh, in China ports, and we are really exchanging, uh, for example, electronic certificates. So, it's not uh, entirely new in terms of the efforts. What we need is really for the willingness to participate, to be able to then uh, come together to look at a problem statement. And I think um, earlier, I just wanted to just give a few points on the earlier questions. Um, indeed, in terms of the data standardization, um, I would say that we will need to use as much of the international standards as possible. These will change, uh, that's for certain. Uh, these will improve and in fact, Every port will have different use cases and different types of data that they need to exchange. But this should not deter our entire efforts because I think we, if we start just like it within this MOU to really look at the problem of port calls, if we can start to tackle one problem at, at a time, we'll begin to discover you know, the processes, the templates of work, and this will get uh, much easier as, as we, we go along. So I'm very optimistic about the, the future and how we can actually bring to fruition the, the anticipation and the vision of everybody to try to get a more uh, globally connected uh, maritime transport chain. Thank you. David, thank you. You know, uh, when, what you just mentioned before, I think it really calls to mind on a couple of things we're really looking at, right? Number one is uh, the fact that uh, I think that there has to be a constant uh, demand, or, or maybe I should use the word demand, a constant ask uh, for all developers around the world for all port administrators who are gonna plan for their maritime single window, for all of the countries that are concerned that they, they, they have to make sure that regardless of what they plan for, their, their pace and their phase of maturity and development standards, that they have to plug that in. There must be a socket ready to go to have different APIs uh, that can work into operability. I think that's a key thing. No, number two, um, I, I sense that uh, there is also a community spirit of sharing. Um, you know, I'm sure the world will be a better place if we have big ports like Port of Rotterdam, even Port of Singapore and the leading ports even in Shanghai to share their, their platforms and, and so that the entire world can accelerate a lot more faster in terms of adoption so that no one has to sit down and reinvent the wheel. I think that's a key thing. And of course, that follows through on the backbone of where IMO sits at in terms of making sure that the FAIL convention and the committee is putting in place longer vision that prepares us for, um, uh, I call it future proofing. And that's pretty much what we're looking towards too. I mean, it's amazing. You look at what Paul mentioned before. I mean, I, I, I knew that Europe is big, but in 24 hours, we have to ship to 500 million customers. I just cannot fathom the level of uh, documentation and data, let alone even, 
even uh, having custody and, and, and securing data security, I mean, that is another nightmare. Maybe I should use the word nightmare, but that's another challenge with the move towards too. So I think pretty much um, it's, it's, uh, it is something that we are in exciting times. We're in an exciting era and, and we are living it to see it through. So um, we are almost reaching, and I'm seeing a signal on my screen that we are reaching towards the end uh, of time because I'm sure people are waiting to do the evening cocktails one and a half hour for webinar is almost enough. Uh, but I wanna thank everyone. Honestly, your questions are coming in fast and furious. They're all really good questions. But I'm looking towards to ask the uh, organizer, uh, MPA to, to uh, maybe ask them if, you, if there's a way that we can, we can share we can share um, presentation materials to the audience that we have in place, that's number one. Number two, and also if there's some way that, uh, that um, the Q and A's uh, can be also further answered by the panelists that we have in place. So uh, once again, I think for the, some of the Q and A's that's been out there that we didn't have time to answer, I apologize for that, but we'll find a way to actually make that work and to, to reach out to you in a separate manner. So, over to you, Don. I think I've done my part. So uh, as the MC, please uh, carry us through to the closing portion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Julian, Paul, and David for this um, great discussion and sharing your insights. Uh, and thank you very much, Michael, for steering the two panels through great depths of conversations on the benefits of uh, common data standards and interoperability on global trade and partnership processes. Um, well, on Michael's ask, we'll try as best as we can to collate the questions. Some of them we may not be able to answer for NPA's part, but on a panelist, we will try to get in touch. We'll get in touch with them with some of these um, questions, and then we will see how we can uh, use our social media to disseminate some of these uh, responses or directly to you if you're captured. Uh, who are the people who are asking the questions uh, throughout uh, this session? All right. So indeed, the MOU signed earlier is a testimony to so how the maritime industry is coming together to bring changes that can improve our efficiency and better leverage digitalization. Now, we hope the program today has helped in your own journey towards tomorrow's world of digital connectivity and common data standards. So as mentioned at the beginning of the get this gathering, uh, today's session is a prologue to the Maritime Perspective webinar series where experts and industry leaders share their insights on digitalization, decarbonization, and trade in a disrupted world. So please do keep a lookout for upcoming sessions of the series as well as our subsequent invites. So we would also like to once again uh, express our gratitude to IMO Secretary General, Mr. Kitat Lim, MPA Chairman, Mr. Niam Chang Ming, our esteemed panelists, Hao Jie, Thomas, Xin Yong, Holian, Paul, and David, as well as our moderator, Michael, and you, our wonderful audience, for joining us today. So till we meet again, remain healthy, be inspired, and stay connected. Bye-bye.